It's time for the movie rating. Tonight's victim is composer John Massari that has done many projects such as Killer Clowns from Outer Space and the current one, Warpath. Hello. Hey, how you doing? Fantastic. So can you tell us what you were allowed to tell us about this film, Warpath? What's going on with this? And can we expect it any time this year at all? Okay, Warpath is a film that was shot this year out in the Midwest. And it's a flat-out traditional Western directed by Josh Becker. And you may know Josh Becker from uh, Xena, Princess Warrior, and countless projects with Sam Raimi. He's been with Sam Raimi forever. And, and I, I guess it's like, I like to call it the Sam Raimi crowd. There's a, a community of filmmakers in the Midwest that they all kind of work together. Oddly enough, months before I got called to do this Western, I was watching a bunch of uh, Western uh, Westerns on YouTube, Old Republic Pictures movie serials, and they were just, they have just had so much charm in them. There was, uh, I believe the composer's name was Eric Smith that did most of the scores, or he was the music director, and they were just great scores, and the characters were, you just loved the characters, the stories were fun. I don't know, you know, sometimes you get in a mood where you want to watch a certain type of movie for a while, but I didn't think much of it, and then two months after that, I get a call to work on a Western, and the script was is a very traditional, like, Western buddy movie, road secured uh, distribution, if I'm not mistaken. It's a movie about a uh, bounty hunter that is hired by a woman who needs to find her husband that has been gone missing for years. On their track, they become friends, and they go through a, a variety of adventures, and it was, it was a lot of fun. It's a fun movie. Uh, Josh Becker is a very good director, and I, I hope to be able to tell you when it's going to be streaming or potentially coming to the theater. I kind of doubt it's rare that movies come to the theater these days. But that's one of the things I finished I can talk about. Now, when it comes to structuring a moment in composing for a film, do you think it's more important to place yourself as the director of that scene to make that moment happen, or do you think there's other methods for that? Well, that's a very good question. You make an interesting supposition there. Basically, it depends. Movie to movie, project to project. Basically, I like to fall in love with whatever I'm working on. I have to really love the characters and feel like they're friends of mine and identify with them, even though they're, it could be protagonists, could be the good guy or the bad guy, it doesn't matter, or a good girl or the bad girl. I, I just feel I have to identify them in some way in order to like be able to make the music work with them. As far as directing the scene, well, it's kind of already been directed. It's kind of what you see is what you get. You can change the interpretation of the scene. I mean, it could be something that you could think humorous, but then you can make the music seem like, oh, wait a minute, they're they're being humorous toward each other, but they're hiding something. You have to know what the intention is. You don't want to rewrite the script with your music. For instance, you could you could do something that makes the movie maybe gives away too much of the plot, and you don't want to do that. Like so the jump, we got a we got a laugh coming up here. I need you to time out the music where it it, it reaches its climax either earlier or later to set up this gap. Oh, and by the way. Comedy is my favorite, and it's the most difficult, but it's my favorite uh, genre to compose to. And I, I must say that when the first Ghostbusters came out, I must have saw it ten times and went into the movie theater at least on four or five occasions with a, a little tape recorder. Record the movie as if it was a radio show, just to listen to the timing of the music when the music comes in and out, how the movie, how the music builds, because Elmer Bernstein is such a master with that. And the same thing for the movie Stripes. This great comedy on on every level, the writing, the acting, the editing, the directing, everything. And so the music, pinpoint accuracy it has to make, it, it has to hit its marks in order to make the joke work. To answer your question, you got to work with the director because it's their movie and they're interpreting a script that they've written and that many people have uh, gone through and approved. But you're right, I do have that power. I can make things seem ridiculous if I wanted to, if I wanted to be very mischievous about it. But other than that, I, I kind of work with the director on, on the mood that they're trying to set. Oh yeah, it's definitely important because when you get into that moment and, and when you see it on screen and you match it up to that moment and they re relive that moment, especially when it gets on soundtrack, if it does go on soundtrack or just simply just memorizing it, that the fact is if, if they if they follow the scene, they follow the music and, and, and that's the most important key of the whole thing and that's where, where, that's where your art really shows. Now, do you think uh, in the business, in this business as a composer, do you think a composer needs to be more self-aware of their product and not just be a reference? Often, it's not really a great practice and I think it's starting to wane there's a practice where when movies are edited and cut together in order to make the time out the cuts better the 
editor and director and producer sometimes put in temp music from another movie, you know, hopefully, like, move the movie along. Quite frankly, it's very difficult to watch a movie that needs music that doesn't have music, and to the untrained eye, it can seem real awkward to watch a movie that doesn't have any music on it. Everyone's, like, looking at each other, like, well, now what's happening, kind of thing. It's good in the fact that easier to watch the, the viewing experience of the movie as they're working on it is easier to watch and work with. The bad side is everyone gets used to whatever that is, so that music starts to perpetuate. You start hearing like the same kind of music in, in most movies. And I think with the past year and a half to two and a half years, we've been moving away from that because there's been a calling out saying, listen, everyone's starting to sound the same. And kids that are studying film music are starting to copy this generic sound. It's not a good thing. And I can tell you, and a lot of other composers tell you, that, that anytime any film that I've done that has not had a temp track, that we had to basically strike everything down and from the ground up, those have been the most successful and memorable films that I've worked on. You know, I tell people of the example of uh, uh, Harry Potter. John Williams was just given a basic concept. And can you come up with a theme so we can make our trailer? And for some reason, they didn't have the trailer ready. And they didn't, maybe they didn't want to show it to him. And based off the description, he did Hedwig's theme, you know, which is a gorgeous piece of music. And it worked wonderfully. And I'm not saying that if they showed him the trailer or told him exactly what the story was, it would have been worse. But it worked. And it also happened with the movie Interstellar. Christopher Nolan approached Hans Zimmer, and he said, he gave him kind of a mood, kind of like a, a supposition. Pretend that uh, you knew you weren't going to be able to see your family forever for quite a while. And the next time you would see your family, they would be much older or something like that, which is kind of like what happens in the movie. Right? But he didn't tell him it. He didn't tell him it was a science fiction movie because he wanted the um, the director wanted the emotion, emotional impact. And so Hans was said, "We'll give it a few weeks." And he came. He did a piece, and he said, "Oh, that that's going to be perfect." And then he told him, "Okay, this is a science fiction thing, and that's going to work." And you know, we're not going for the science fiction sound. We're coming from a human emotion. So there you go. Uh, I mean, that's my explanation. Basically, over reference other music in new music is it thankfully I think it's seeing it today hopefully never repeated <laughs> unbeknownst to some people they over push the music and it, this is not an easy business if someone can like write a script and produce a movie shoot put it in front of the camera with the actors and, and get it done like complete it like it's done it's like ready to show even if it's mediocre I'm not kidding now just listen to me even if it's mediocre that's a giant accomplishment but it's not easy to do let me use a baseball metaphor lowest ranking professional American or National League baseball player in the United States an exceptional athlete compared to the average person so back to my thing you know, we could sit there in our armchair and look at a movie and say oh god it sucks it's just slow it's just... but you know what they actually finished it and it was done competently <laughs> uh, sometimes you know people uh, they may like overdo it give away you want a, like a really great jump scare sometimes you don't put any music in the scene until the scare happens and sometimes literally a two frames after you see it then the music comes in it's like you slightly see it and it might incrementally see it it's almost imperceptible and then bam the music hits but if the music is scary to setting up to the jump scare or there's like a red herring you have scary music and you think there's going to be a jump scare or something crazy is going to happen and then you realize it's like you know the cat came back in the house Oh, definitely, because it's it's a setup. It's like yeah. it's set up, especially if it's hard, like you mentioned, if it's uh, creepy music. It, you know, maybe there's something coming around the corner, or maybe it's just a build up. Maybe nothing will happen, and then the next two, three scenes later, bam, right in your face. The the music itself is so important to feel the emotion as the characters are feeling the same emotion. And if you feel the same emotion as these characters are feeling the emotion, and listening to the composition as the scene goes then that that's one big accomplishment because you're feeling what the movie is feeling at the same time because it's it's, its own identity on its own and if you feel it and they as as they feel it that's that's a big accomplishment on its own it's like that's a win-win for everybody like you as a comp composer everything else in general and it's, it's truly fantastic because then later on you're going to remember that theme absolutely very very iconic but you know the industry does change and when when it changes in direction all the time do you think as an artist they have to actually limit this in order to keep identity and even their own reputation 
as the industry changes? I can only speak for myself. If I was approaching any score, or even a new score, like I did in 1991, it wouldn't be a very rewarding experience. It's always very gratifying to change your game, to adopt a new angle or approach. People in just about every industry, not just music. Regarding nostalgia, wanting to do things like they did back in the day. Well, a good way to look at it is you should look at the past, not as a reference of what to do today, but you want to look at the past in a critical way and just take from the past that works today and use your modern mindset to go forward. I don't think you can have a standard in anything, really, you know, because you're not going to, things are going to stagnate. If I approach things the same way I did years ago, I mean, there's basic things that I do that are similar. Like, I, so I don't get caught up in timing. I, I, I get caught up more in the story and the emotion of uh, whatever I'm working on than worrying, about, even thinking for a second about the technical aspect. Where back in the day, you had to, like, kind of start off with the technical aspects because you had to do, like, a television show in three days and you had to work out all your timings right away, you know. And But it's so much different now. You don't have to worry about that because you have computers that you can just start feeding music in and editing it as you go, and it just has a completely different feel and sound than it did, like, an episodic television from the 70s or 80s. Credibility. When you're doing a lot of films and what you're succeeding more and, of course, getting much more experience as you go, do you think that the credibility is more of a tool and, in some cases, the art is actually just the foreground of the artist's ability in some cases? I, I don't think, you know, the audience will tolerate that. You know what I'm saying? I, I think just about everyone I know that's worth their salt has um, has innovated, has you know, has sought to challenge themselves. You know, I mean, to basically face the unknown and move forward and try to champion that unknown. I mean, uh, for instance, Danny Elfman. Danny Elfman doesn't really do music like he did in the '80s. It's different. You can kind of hear his style, but he has different approaches. Like, for instance, one of my favorite scores of his is not a typical Elfman score, and that's Good Will Hunting. That was a score of the, the drama. My respect for him went up greatly after seeing that film. And I, I mean, I can hear influences of composers that not everyone knows about, but other composers know about. Like, there's, there's a classical composer who's still alive. I think he's in his 90s now. His name is Arvo Perch. From Estonia, it was one of the, it used to be a Soviet state, and he just has this beautiful, beautiful, like sacred type of music, and, and you can hear really influences, like you can tell that Danny Elfman was listening to that and being influenced by it. Well, not, not copying it, but just being influenced by it, and another, another, a number of other composers. And, and you know, Hans Zimmer, he, I think he broke away from a certain sound that he had for a while uh, with Interstellar. Uh, and he didn't treat it like an action film. So I appreciate when people really change things up and they do the unexpected and it works. I have worked with other composers. I have worked actually for other composers helping them do their projects. It's been very rare they've taken a credit as additional music because I just don't want to. It's just, some people just need help getting through something. We don't, we all, we don't want to leave anything unfinished or uh, done inadequately. So we, we, you know, we call on people to help us out. And I, I can tell you, I had one experience with a composer that was working on a particular project, and he confided in me. He says, I, "I'm just getting sick of doing this. It's just uh, basically they want a slight variation of the same thing. And any time I tried to do something new, they, this was at a time where." You were not allowed to reuse music that was previously recorded. You always had to look the reunion rules that you had to record new music for every new episode. I think it started in the late 60s because, as you know, like the old Star Trek series, they used to record the music for a particular number of episodes and then recycle those pieces of music throughout the rest of the season to save money. And I think that was negotiated out and we had to do, it was a lot more work, and which was good. But this particular composer was like just pulling his hair out because I'm sick of doing the same thing. I just don't know what to do now. They want me to do the same thing. So he would have other composers do the thing he was doing all these years and he would just like conduct or just do, you know, out of 20 minutes per each episode, he would only do like a couple of minutes you know, just to save his sanity. So, um, and what's really sad is that afterwards, after that was done, there was just nothing else to do. No, everyone remembered. 
remembered him for years of the same music, no change whatsoever. You know, here's a good example. You have Alan Silvestri that was doing a, a TV series called um, Chips about the Highway Patrol. It's like, I think, if I recall his recollection story correctly, he was just, after he'd done that series, he just, he just let the phone start, stopped ringing. I think he did a movie called Fandango with Kevin Costner. It was really cool. And then uh, not too long after that, he did, I believe, Romancing the Stone before he went on to Back to the Future. There's an example of someone who's doing a certain type of music for a number of years, be like type, musically typecasted for that kind of music and just never move, or they can just get out of their comfort zone and seek out other people to work with. And it's not easy. I mean, to be very honest with you, when I did this for Josh Becker, when I did the Western, they said, well, you're known as the Killer Clowns guy. What do you know from Western? I go, well, I don't know if you looked at my IMDb. I also did a feature, a, a biblical feature, called The Story of Jesus Christ, which has nothing to do with Killer Clowns from outer space. So I think I'm, I'm very qualified to do a Western. And so after I did this, like the first cue, they were just really thrilled. But I did the opening title. It's very iconic. Western, you know, Americana, cinematic Western music. And so you have to kind of like jump off the cliff, so to speak. And Slee Bradbury used to say this. You know, you want to change in your life. You got to just jump off the cliff and figure out how to fly on your way down. You know, because that's the only way you're going to move forward. Well, go ahead and plug in any websites that you want to plug in or anything that we can check out right now. As far as website, you caught me. It's still being constructed, so I'm not going to give you a uh, we're, we're working on it uh, kind of thing. You know, just go to my SoundCloud. My SoundCloud has a pretty good amount of music, and it's, it gets updated regularly. It's very eclectic stuff, very new and experimental. I did the sequel to The, the Cell. There was a sequel. It wasn't it was that popular of a sequel to that movie, but uh, the music sure was a lot of fun to work on. It was like absolutely terrifying music. It was so terrifying that my kids as teenagers, it makes them uncomfortable. So uh, that was a lot of fun. That, that And that's pretty frightening stuff. And I believe, I yeah, I think I maintained ownership of that music. Uh, friends of mine that put on haunts, I, I'll, I'll let them use a few tracks from that. Go see Killer Clowns from Outer Space at Orlando Universal, um, excuse me, Halloween Horror Nights in Orlando at Universal Studios and Halloween Horror Nights in Hollywood at Universal Studios because it's only going to be on until November 3rd. And uh, I may be out at the Hollywood location for Halloween proper, October 31st. So maybe you might want to come out there and uh, say hi to Uncle John. Beauty of Halloween Horror Night that uh, every year during the Halloween season in both Hollywood and in Orlando at Universal Studios is to see the dedication that the fans, the loyal fans come out in support of their favorite horror movie brands. And we're so blessed to have Killer Clowns from Outer Space at both locations in Hollywood and Orlando. And let me tell you how inspiring it is to see people wait for two hours in line. Sometimes the lines have as many as 3,000 people in them. To have an experience that lasts for 10 minutes, I say this to the people that want to see a sequel that ask me all the time, when are you guys going to do another movie? When are you going to do another movie? Well, let me tell you how it happened at Universal Studios. The only reason why it's at Universal Studios is because the fans demanded it. They told the people at Universal Orlando and in Hollywood, we want to kill the clowns from outer space haunted house. And they gave it to them. It's simple as that. So if you direct that desire, maybe to the intellectual property owners of Killer Clowns from Outer Space, which in this case just happened to be MGM, Metro Golden Mare. Maybe if they got 100,000 emails, maybe if they got a million emails, maybe if they got 2 million emails, they would definitely respond, you know, especially if you want the Kyoto Brothers to produce it, and if you want John Sorry to do the music score and maybe bring back the Dickies to do a different incarnation of the opening theme, I think we can give you a wonderful movie. So what do you think about that? And there you have it, everybody. That is John Masari.